So today I'm going to talk to you about um, dating violence and specifically sexual violence within dating relationships. So like we've said before, this is a difficult topic, so I want you again to check in with yourself emotionally, take care of yourself, and then step out if you need. I will stay afterwards today and then I'll also have contact with your teacher if you need to debrief at any point in the future. I will ask you to give examples, but as always, you have the opportunity to pass. And um, just be aware that this is a difficult topic and it's not going to be a fun topic, but it's super important. So I have a question. How um, common do you think that sexual violence is in dating relationships? relatively uncommon. And so what we know when we talked about the harmful behaviors that are possible is that that is one of those harmful behaviors that is always possible. But what we also know that it actually is pretty common. So if you look at sexual violence in general, um, most of the statistics say that one in three women and one in six men will experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. So if you think about someone in your life, three women and six men, the likelihood that someone that you know is is, is or will be a survivor of sexual assault is really, really common. So part of what we will talk about today are some myths and facts. We'll talk about the importance of consent, and then we'll also talk about what we need to do to be supportive of those survivors that will be a part of our lives. So when we go back to how common dating in sexual, sexual violence in dating is, we know that one in 10 or 10% of individuals who are in dating relationships report some form of sexual violence either having happened or is happening. So 10% for teenagers or for youth is really, really high. Um, and another kind of myth that we think is that this um, happens only by people that we don't know. We know that most um, assaults, about 90 to 85%, will happen by someone that you know. So that could be a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a partner, um, or just a friend, or someone in family, or someone in your school. So again, when we think about why people don't talk about this subject, it is because if it's happening by someone that you trust or that you know, it's a very difficult thing to come forward to. Another common thing that we like to think is that we don't like to talk about consent. Can somebody give me one word to define consent? Permission. Permission. So we have permission. permission. So everybody's heard no means no, right? No should always mean no. And we have the we have the requirement to respect that. But I'm going to push it a step forward and say that it should be also enthusiastic. So what I mean by that is if I'm hugging someone and I hug them and they say, don't hug me, what are they doing? They're taking away their permission and they're doing it verbally and maybe even physically. Maybe they're pushing me away. So consent can be verbal or physical and it can be taken away in both ways. Um, but when I say enthusiastic, I also mean that if I'm hugging someone, I don't just want them to be standing there. I want them to be fully participating and enthusiastic. So if they're not enthusiastic, then I know that I don't have consent. And that's my cue to either talk about consent or step away from the situation because it's obviously not consent. Um, consent has to be ongoing. If I give permission for someone to hug me, does that mean that I give permission for someone to kiss me? No. Does that mean that I give permission for anything else? No. So it has to be ongoing at each and every step of the way. If that's taken away either verbally or physically, then again, that's my cue to either step back or have a conversation about what's going on in that situation. We talked a little bit about setting boundaries in the previous sections, and so this is where we're going to talk about that. So I want you to get in your groups, and we're going to talk a little bit about what are the, the boundaries and the way that we can communicate about consent. Okay, now that we've had time to do that, <laughs> um, I want to talk about the exceptions to consent. So one, um, you cannot consent under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And that's so important to know because especially in this age group, we might be in situations where that might happen. And it's so important, again, that we take that as our cue to either intervene or get the resources that we need to make sure that we are not pushing um, and violating someone's right to give or take away consent. There are also some exceptions depending on your age. Those get complicated um, and we can talk in more detail um, 
in private if you have specific questions. But basically, no one under the age of 14 can consent to any activity. And then 16, 15, and 17, it varies on the activity and the age of the individuals. And then we always want to talk about power. You cannot consent to someone that's in a position of authority or power. That could be a teacher, that could be a doctor, that could be your priest or bishop. And that goes back to, again, when we're talking about harmful behavior, someone that has so much power over you that uh, their ability to harm you just skyrockets. And so that's why you can't consent. So again, we're going to break up into, into groups and talk a little bit about these scenarios and talk a little bit more about consent. So we're going to talk about um, the section on preventing dating sexual violence. This is often the most difficult topic for facilitators, usually because they're not, even if we work in this field, we're not always used to talking about sexual violence or rape. So the first thing I want you to do is get used to the language. Um, get used to using the word rape get used to using the word sexual violence and know your resources beforehand. And oftentimes I will see facilitators like blush or kind of stumble through that language. So if you need to practice with other people in, in your agency and just make sure because if you're not comfortable talking or asking questions about this topic, the students won't either. Um, make sure again, this is a really common topic to genderize. So make sure that you're not doing that. So when we talk about sexual violence, we often talk about it as females, as victims, and males as perpetrators. You want to make sure that you're not doing that and you acknowledge that males can be survivors as well, especially because in a costume you're going to have a, about a 50-50 um, gender mix. You want to make sure that you're including the boys, especially because that's so important to prevention um, in this topic. And then check your judgment at the door. And what I mean by this is that for most of these students, this is going to be the first conversation they have about consent, sexual assault, dating violence, all of those things. And so sometimes you will have students that will ask questions that may be triggering for you. They'll ask questions. I once had a student ask me, do I really have to ask consent every time? And I felt myself just getting triggered in that. And I took a step back and I pushed it back on him and I said, oh, can you tell me more about that? And it turned out that he was just a really curious kid that had a girlfriend for a really long time and he was just really wanted to know how he could have better conversations with his girlfriend but if I had reacted from the very first moment I heard that question I probably would have shut down that conversation and shut down so many of the students in that classroom so you just want to think about it these students really want to know and even if they ask the question maybe a little bit rudely or more abruptly than we're used to just know that they're there to learn and they're gonna model that from you um, we already talked about trauma-informed Go back to that section to kind of learn because it's especially important in this topic. Um, and make sure that you talk to the teacher or the facilitator or administrator that is in the room beforehand and afterwards. They know their students. They'll usually know if a student is a survivor. And I usually like to touch base and say, you know, if you know that your student is a survivor, just let them know I can talk afterwards if they're feeling triggered. That's always so important. This is also the section where a lot of teachers will have questions about the requirements under the State Board of Education. One quick way that I kind of just touch on that is my examples that I use when I'm talking about consent or sexual abuse are always PG. What I mean by that is that I use kissing, hugging, holding hands. Um, it sounds silly, but I just keep my scenarios kind of there. If the students want to bring up other scenarios, great, they can do that, but I my examples will always be there. If the students ask a question that I know is kind of pushing towards that State Board of Education requirements, I'll either refer to the teacher, so say, Mrs. Smith, can you tell me what you would say about that? The teacher knows her students, they know what they're asking. Um, or I'll say, you know, that's a really great question, let's talk about it afterwards. And we'll just kind of move on. Um, but for the most part, those requirements don't really impede this section or any of the sections at all. We can have really great conversations without having to worry about them. Um, and the trickiest part for this section is consent. We have this idea that consent is this really hard topic. And so just remember, one, study up on what consent means and what it doesn't mean. And just start really basically. Um, you can talk about permission with any audience and just build from there. Um, you will get some common questions. Um, can you consent if you're drunk? Can you, you'll get some challenges with that. So make sure that you have a really quick and easy answer that you can um, answer to that. 
and that um, you don't get frazzled because that's a question that's easy to get frazzled. Um, the next part that they will often challenge is the age of consent or why they can't consent if they can consent to certain things. I like to leave that one vague because once I, I don't like to get into details of people's personal relationships in a classroom, but I will just kind of say, you know, if you're under 14, these are the rules. 15, 16, these are the general guidelines. It's really great. We can talk about this afterwards if you have specific questions. And I always like to talk about power when it comes to that. And that's a really great conversation starter to the idea that when you have imbalances of power, it's really easy to have abusive or harmful behaviors. And that usually gets to the root of the issue of why they're asking about consent or why maybe they're having a hard time with consent. If we look at consent as the balancing of power in order to build healthy sexual relationships, then it's pretty simple for students to get it and we can kind of um, navigate some of those difficult questions that come up with that. So if you have any questions or comments about these topics, you can reach me um, at s.mergia at raperecoverycenter.org.